Hey guys, welcome to the Spiritable Podcast. My name is Luke. And my name is Richard. I'm currently getting my master's in theology. And I have absolutely no marketable skills whatsoever. And we're going to be talking about spirituality and everyday life struggles from our non-traditional Christian background. Obviously, we don't have all the answers, so we're going to be dragging on some guests to diversify and talk about their opinions and perspectives. Yeah, and we think it's weird that people aren't more open talking about spiritual ideas and stuff like this in everyday conversation, so we're talking about it here. Boom. And we have like zero followers or listeners right now, so we're having a blast anyway. Jump on board. Yeah. So feel free to give it a watch and welcome, friends. It says welcome, friends, in here. You can't say on board because on board's my line, Luke. That's true, but I don't know. I don't know what to say for my last line when you say on board. So do you say jump jump on board? I won't say anything. All right, start over. Three, two, one. Hey, guys. Thanks for tuning back into the Spiritable Podcast. And this week we have a special guest, our friend Wesley Lockard. What's up? Look at this guy. Uh, Wes, tell us about yourself. If you, oh, I asked a good question last week. Yeah, if you had a dating profile, what would your profile say? Um, uh, you don't want to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> okay, right, wait. Tell say, us about your, your background. It would say something really dumb. Like, just really dumb. Mine right now says something so stupid. What I don't want to say it. On this. <laughs> Why? It's it's just stupid stuff. The last time I had just clip art images of spiders all over all of the selfies of uh, me, which were all really bad too. And then I just wrote out the spider song from uh, it, It's Always Sunny oh, that Charlie yeah, sings. Yeah, classic. Just dumb stuff like that. Um, I got to actually come to your guys' house and take a photo with all the rubber duckies oh, yeah. you got. That's true. Um, you bought a lot of rubber duckies at one point. Five thousand. Five thousand. Five thousand. They're very cheap. Five thousand. Yeah. Five. We we own five thousand rubber ducks. Some it's of them might deal. be growing mold at this point. Anyway, uh, so you know, part of our podcast here is talking about our spiritual lives and talking about big life concepts and that kind of thing. So if you feel comfortable with it, uh, if you want to talk about like your spiritual uh, kind of growth and where you started and where you're at now, hmm. if you're anywhere. In a spiritual realm. Well, I grew up in this general area, um, and I grew up with uh, the new church. Um, but now I definitely kind of moved away from that. I'm in a, like a more kind of agnostic territory. Sometimes uh, atheist, sometimes agnostic. It kind of shifts as things like that do, I feel like, for a lot of people. you mm-hmm. know. Sometimes you definitely are like... If you, if you are religious, you're definitely way more like convicted and way more into it. And then there are other days where you're like, oh, it's what not were you worth convicted it. of? Hmm? What? Hmm? Oh. So let's move on from that one too. That, that has something to do with the no dating, dating profile. profiles, yeah. no arrest. The history. two are linked. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna ask you a, a personal question then. Was there? Because this isn't even something I know about you as a friend, but was there a, a point where that shift happened for you, where you were like, yeah, I love, I love. I love God. And the next moment you're like, eh, I don't know about this. Well, it definitely like, it wasn't like a a shift, like a hard turn or anything. I, I, it was sort of a more gradual thing as I got older. I think definitely going from like 18 to like 20, I was kind of leaning in that direction already. Um, And then as a lot of people I think in my position do, you go through, like, there's one, like, point of trauma or one really hard thing that you go through that either reinforces your faith to, like, a maximum degree and you spend the rest of your life maybe feeling that way or just decimates it and you feel like, yeah, forget all that. That wasn't there for me when I needed it, so I don't really feel connected to it anymore. Hmm. But I, I think that's a very common thing. Yeah. At least from talking to people who've gone through similar stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that that 18 to 20 year old period is the time of life where people question stuff a ton and like develop who they are and what they think is out there. So that makes, yeah. that makes sense to me. Definitely. I mean, you're already doing that with like beyond anything spiritual. You're already doing that with just the physical world around you and figuring out, you know, kind of where you are as an adult, how you fit in with other groups of people socially. Yeah. So that definitely is all tied up in that. Yeah. That doesn't stop at 20. Let me tell you. <laughs> Still true. like, who am I? Yeah, dude, I'll wake up some days and be like, I know nothing. <laughs> I feel like all of your 20s, especially now, because 
with all of this information in this technological world, I feel like people are so much more like existential and depressed in general than mm. other generations, at least talking to them. And I don't know if that's realistic or if people don't remember accurately or if it, it truly does have to do with, you know, like, like people say, the more connected you are, the, the more isolated we become. Hmm. The more alone we can feel because we're yeah. constantly surrounded by things. Exactly. Of. Maybe yeah. it's like an overstimulation sort of oh, thing. Oh, I definitely think that's an issue. Yeah, I think a lot of that comes down to people feeling like they can replace community mm. in a way that it doesn't work. Like, I know that I can feel connected through online community, but I never feel connected through online community like I do in person when I'm really feeling connected. Like, the most connected I ever felt in person is on a completely different level from the most connected I've ever felt online. Right. And even like like one of my friends and I are playing World of Warcraft together right now and I always make sure to like if I can go over to his house to play because it's so much more fun to play sitting next to him oh, yeah. than it is to like speak over voice chat. Because just that physical community I think is so important. It's true. I mean, I I have uh, I, I definitely have a lot to say about this whole subject because, like, I there was a period of my life where, like, I just kind of isolated myself and spent most of my time purely socializing through the internet. And I mean, it, it wasn't exclusively that, but the majority of like my social time was spent doing that. And again, playing WoW and stuff, like, <laughs> which it, I, I think there definitely is limits to it, like you said. But also, just like with any relationship, the amount of effort you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. So there are friends that I have, like, in, in January, I'm flying out to Arizona because every year, like, my closest friends from all over the world all get together. In and, Arizona? Yeah. Well, we're doing Arizona this year. But, okay. Nice. Um, we always do that because these are all people that, like, really <clears throat> actually care about each other. and We talk all the time and, like, want to spend time together. But that's only because we've all put in the effort to, like, maintain these relationships. Right. Whereas... I can't tell you how many literal hundreds of friends I've had that I felt like close with that I barely remember anymore. And I'll see their name in like Facebook memories or something and be like, oh yeah, I used to talk <laughs> to that person every day. That's so weird. Like, Yep. How things come and go. But, but yeah. I think the reason why you're all flying out to Arizona is because you recognize that there's something that you get from physical community that you Absolutely. can't get from online, online community. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's not to say that online <clears throat> community like – is worthless or meaningless, but I think that there is something missing. And when you try to completely substitute one with the other, you end up feeling empty. Absolutely. I think a lot of people Absolutely. do see the online communities as the the final step. Like, oh, this is this is this is good enough. Like, oh, look, I found yeah. a community. Boop, I'm done. Um, and that can work well for a little bit, but I think eventually, yeah, you start to want that that face to face because that's just. I mean, we've. We've had that for how long as human beings? Like, that's just yeah. the way community has been for us, and it's not going to change in a decade, you know? Right. No, definitely, definitely. I mean, the, beyond just, like, the physical limitations of what you can do over the Internet, you're right. There is definitely something way more real than, like, sitting here with you guys right now versus if we were all in, like, a Discord call mm -hmm. or Skype for you old people. <laughs> I'm, I'm really I'm good, doing good a good job. <laughs> you're old people. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, there's definitely like a difference in like the energy and way you can communicate and just the whole feel of, of everything. It's different looking someone directly in the eyes versus through a screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's an emotional and I would say spiritual way that people interact. Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. oh spoilers. <laughs> That's what this podcast is about. Uh, spiritual way that people interact. Even if you don't see spiritual as like relating to heaven and hell and God. I think they're. I think uh, some people uh, can call it just like energies. Yeah, something kind of more than just natural that happens between people uh, when they're in the same space. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I I mean, haven't there been like studies done on that about um, empathizing with people, like looking them in the face and shocking them versus looking at someone through a screen? Oh, I feel like. Oh I yeah, no, that was a whole thing where someone was in a different room and they could shock someone. Oh yeah, just because a doctor was telling them, and they heard unquote. them, but they couldn't see them. That's it, right? <clears throat> it was something yeah. like that. It's a weird like dehumanization thing where if you don't see some, like like right now, if you're given the choice to press a button hey, and kill me or Richard, or press a button and kill ten people who you've never seen before, 
It'd probably be easier for you to press that button to ben. kill ten people, or just yeah, Ben. ben he's behind the matter. camera. And doesn't even <laughs> 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 hey. um, but you know, it'd be it might be easier for you to press that button and kill people yeah. who you don't know, and that's you know harsh and sad, but just a a harsh reality kind of. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that idea of anonymity plays into it a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think that's sure. why there's also a much different tone in a lot of online communication than there is offline. I think people are much <laughs> Well, because you can be anonymous happier. immediately. Yeah, and people are much happier saying whatever they want because there's no repercussions other than someone maybe starts yelling at you and you just leave. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, like, and even beyond like that, there's just even that like little separation. It's so funny. Like if you're driving and someone cuts you off, you like flip them off and yell at them. If you're standing in line at the grocery store and someone gets in line in front of you, you're not gonna be like, "Hey, screw you, buddy! <laughs> Pull over, fight me!" Like you, you'll true. never do that just because yeah. you're right there in front of them. But for some reason, being in two cars like just separates Presents you that enough. enough. Yeah. yeah. Where you get all like ballsy and you're like, oh, let's go. Testosterone pumping. And they roll down their window and you're like, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. Yes. Sir, I had no idea. That's that right. you really, were a real I didn't person. know. Oh my goodness. The second I... that glass is down, <laughs> it's that eye contact. Well, we make lovey eyes at each other. <laughs> Blow them a little kiss. Uh, well, I think that's, that's a really fascinating thing about the internet is that with all this anonymity, it gives you an opportunity to be whoever you want to be. Like, you don't have to have any sort of barrier of, oh, this is even my body, or this is the way my voice sounds. Right. Like, you can create a personality out of thin air, and, like, all these facades are broken down, so you can be as different from yourself as you want to be, or you can be the best version of yourself that you want to be immediately. Yeah. And I think it's kind of an interesting sort of spiritual experiment to see where people gravitate to. I had an interesting conversation two days ago. So I play... For those of you that don't know, a game called League Fortnite. of Legends, oh, not sorry. Fortnite. <clears throat> a game called League of Legends, which is notorious for having the most like toxic and hateful uh, player mm-hmm. base of any game. Whether that's true or not, it's pretty true. Um, well as whether that's K-pop true or not, game. it's pretty true. <laughs> <laughs> whether it's the most hateful or not, it is fairly hateful. Um, and I've gotten into this weird habit of like after a game, there's like a little chat that everyone ends up in for as long as they want to stay. And oftentimes people will like argue back and forth in that chat and yell at each other and call each other all sorts of horrible things. And I've gotten into the habit of just like waiting around and talking to like one person after they leave and try to like talk them through why they are angry and <laughs> You try to counsel like, people on Yeah, like legends. two days ago <laughs> What? I had a conversation that started with one guy <laughs> using a uh, <laughs> mentally challenged slur and then a homosexual slur. That's how the conversation began. Just <laughs> boom, boom. Had you even done anything at that point or were you just like in the lobby? It wasn't at me. It was at another person. Mm. And ended with me and that person both saying, God bless you. No. <laughs> this is the most you thing I've ever <laughs> after heard we had, After life. I had talked to him about like his son and I had told <laughs> him about my wedding coming up <laughs> and like we had really bared our souls to each other. <laughs> And I was basically like, dude, that other person that you just called all those things and called a mindless ape is a real person that feels things, whether you can see them or not. And he was like, yeah, fair enough. But like he had it coming and like we talked about like all this stuff. I was like, dude, you're a father. Like, is this the kind of father you want to be for your son? He's like, well, obviously not. And like we talked through it. I was, was like 45 minutes. Wow. After the game. Why are you wasting your time with these maniacs on I like, I like to believe that it's doing someone somewhere some good. And maybe I'll never see it, but maybe next time he wants to call someone a horrible word and continue a verbal dialogue of hate, he'll think twice. You know? That's our new podcast, is Verbal Dialogue of Hate. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the after podcast, where we just really reverse everything. But I also think if you're going in to play a league, you have to go in with a little bit of a thick skin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, you never know. I talk to people like that because I am so <clears throat> baffled by people that invest so much of their ego oh my in gosh. a video game that they are that furious well, after the game. I mean, well, don't sound too high and mighty, because, like, well, at least for me, I, I get too invested sometimes. I'm like, Luke. Come on, man! Pull yourself out of this. I get like, I get over competitive in certain things, and when I do, I stop playing because yeah. I'm like, this is not, this is no longer fun, and it's a game. I just want to be an ass. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the moment it's not fun, I stop playing because games are made to be fun. But there are people that play like 12 hours of this game a day and are raging the entire time. I'm like, what? Why are you doing this? And someone's like, huh, you're bad at this game. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's a it's a game. It's not a moral yeah. failing. Well, it's because, I mean, obviously you get like a little bit of a like superiority high from being like, you're bad at this. And the implication there yeah. is I'm good at well, it. Because you can just pump up your ego immediately it's, with yeah. games. And, it's the and that same kind of thing. thing as anything that's like hateful and toxic like that. It's the same thing as racism and sexism and any of that is by being so like by spending all that energy being angry and, and hateful towards this like group of people, whatever it is, you're boosting yourself up because at the end of the day, you're not them. Mm. I think that's what it is, like blanket term, all of that <clears throat> well, stuff. Well, I think the, yeah, the us versus them mentality, I'm trying to think of an example where it doesn't, but to me, it seems like it always breaks down to this is us and so we're better than exactly. them. Exactly. It's not just saying. like we're different, us and them. No, it's we're us, better. Them. Exactly. We're up here, you're down there. Right. And I, I think there are positive ways to appreciate diversity, but I think no. the, the, the <laughs> garbage. <laughs> Solid. I think the of three course. white dudes say, <laughs> <laughs> I think the us versus them mentality is, is innately a hierarchical, hierarchical mm. mentality, right. Good bless. you know, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> saying we are, we are better than whoever they are. Yeah, definitely. You know? But so, yeah. gentlemen, at this point, we can continue talking about the internet, and I have lots of fun, like, correlations between internet communities and how heaven is arranged. So we can go into that and fun <laughs> stuff, or we can back it up and pull a topic out of a hat and see what that's like. Mm. What do we think? I'm down for either. I brought my own topic. It's 10 points on why Israel is not a legitimate state, and I'm hoping we can really... <laughs> Just support the Palestinians on this podcast. I want to make sure. <laughs> All right, so Palestine, let's talk. Dear Palestine. The Gaza Strip, baby. <laughs> no, I threw that one out. I know you did. <laughs> no, I didn't. It's been decided we're pulling a topic out of the hat. Just kidding. Ben behind the camera sucks, and we're going to do our own thing. <laughs> so, here's my idea that internet communities are like heavenly communities. Whoa, Luke, what? I disagree. Richard disagrees. So, to back that up, I think heaven is formed uh, in sort of the way that ideal human societies would form, as in there are different communities that happen in heaven that form around people of similar. Uh, interests or what they love or what they want to gather themselves around. So just like there are communities on earth, there are communities in heaven, but they're just oriented around uh, what people do and what they love. Okay? Pause. On the internet, <clears throat> you can immediately go and find any community that you want around any sort of idea, any sort of subculture or mainstream culture or interest or anything, and you can find people with that same interest or hobby or whatever so you can immediately go and do that and join to this community and so you have all these different internet communities that pop up around very specific things with people who are dedicated to that certain value or whatever just like in heaven how you join communities that reflect everything that you that everyone there loves or values and i think that's so cool and we can see how this is happened over time and and how that's just a natural human instinct is to connect to people who have these similar uh, loves or wants or values and we can do that immediately over the internet just how in heaven things are arranged like that and I think that's so powerful cool I I think that it's not this is not a exclusively heaven thing okay fair um, I think this this idea that you gather based on what you love is I think more of a reality after you die. Um, but I think it totally happens on, on earth. And we hear that, we see that in like the classic, like different cliques in high school, yeah. you know, people gather around the things and even our word usage. When you want to connect to someone, when you want to feel 
like you share a love with someone, what do you say? I want to feel closer to you. You're, it's, you're using physical proximity to express wanting to feel an emotional connection. So I think there's innately in humanity this sense of gathering around what people love. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think it's just easier to do over the internet. Yeah, yeah. So there's you have less barriers. Yeah, there's less barriers. Like, I mean, if, if you didn't have the internet, all of those friends you have that are going to gather in Arizona, you would never have met each other. Yeah. But instead, you formed a group around similar interests, similar loves, um, through the internet. But or similar hates sometimes that I think reflects a more hellish community. Don't yeah. you think though that I mean that is kind of detrimental to the, the, like just like we were talking about earlier how that people see that as like the final forefront of socialization which i think is a much more kind of like boomer baby boomer thing to think because i feel like most people our generation are hip to the fact that facebook kind of sucks and nobody really wants to spend all of their time on like facebook or twitter or anything didn't you used to spend like all day on facebook I, yeah oh yeah <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> Facebook now is like a timer for how much like you've been on there, and it's like embarrassing. Oh no! <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. Uh, what I'm saying is, I think that's ultimately detrimental to the actual community where you actually live in real life. Mm-hmm. These these physical interactions we have that we already said are more valuable than the digital ones because you can really get specific, like overly specific, with the kind of community you want to be a part of based off of what you're into that can take you out of real life ones where mm. yeah maybe you don't have like you know the fact that you're writing a 10,000 page Aragon fan fiction in common with your neighbor but you should probably still talk to them maybe and who yeah. does that nobody knows who their neighbors are right. anymore yeah i don't talk to my neighbors oh, but i remember I, as a kid like walking down the street and just like yeah saying like like that old timey sort of I, I hung out with this old lady down the street from me for yeah. no reason. I would just go over to her house and eat cookies and hang out with her smelly mm-hmm. old dogs. And Mrs. I Schaefer the next door. Thing. Yeah. I had a lady across the street that had two dogs. I'd come over and play with her dogs. What yeah. kid do you know does that? Dogs. Because their parents be like, you're not going to that weird old person's house. We don't like, know them. Yeah. yeah. And like, I've weirdly observed my neighbors build this weird rock garden with these strange like <laughs> bulb lights and just kind of like peering over the hedges like... Looking at them, and never interacting. I'm never gonna say like, "What the hell are you making?" <laughs> I'm just gonna like silently observe. And yeah, I do think that's sort of detrimental. And I and I miss that that physical community aspect of it because and you do get a di- diversity. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. I was about to say the, that that diversity. I think when you can be like, "Oh, these people have different opinions than me," and so there's conflict. So I'm just gonna retreat to my internet community right. that everyone. Just is constantly same. fluffs my ego and is like, yes, what you believe is great because exactly. we believe it Exactly. Yeah. It's an echo chamber. Exactly. And you, you just kind of live in this fluffy world where you're like, yeah, I don't want to talk to this person because I disagree with them. How many times, <clears throat> in especially since 2016, how many times have you seen the phrase, blah, 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 if you believe this, block me? Or if, oh if, gosh, you, yeah. if you support this, unfriend, unfriend, me, unfriend if... me now. What is I that? I hate it. I hate that mentality. What the hell is that? That is saying I am too lazy to back up what I think. I'm too lazy to have a discussion. It's just not worth the effort because I know we're just going to end up yelling at each other. And that's like, that's some baby preschool shit right there. That is, <laughs> that is just horrifically yeah. immature. I think at best it comes down to people just not wanting negativity in their life, which is a very like now yeah. thing. And, and I, I get that. And I think positivity is really cool. And uh, obviously people should strive to live a positive life, but I think you can have, the problem is that I think people aren't practiced at dealing Mm. with differences of opinion. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of our polarization has come from. I mean, so many internet communities are an us versus them community. They're like, we have, we have formed this identity for ourselves. I mean, the phrase like normies (laughs) is an internet thing that that's in working with high schoolers, I really get really frustrated a lot of times. Do they yeah. talk about oh, they norm- talk about normies? Oh, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with high schoolers. Dude. And oh, it's God. it's it's like it's like people who are you know those those normal people who see all the internet things after we elitists have seen them first. Oh, like I I saw that meme months ago. Exactly like that kind of thing. And it's like la- a laughable concept because who cares? 
But I think at the core of it is this elitist mm. us versus them, oh, really hateful sure. mentality. And so I get increasingly frustrated at its usage. And, and also elitism is easy. Like yeah. It's so easy to be, immediately be like, oh, we're the same. Cool. He is different. Hate him. Well, that's yeah. why like fascism works, and that's why yeah, any kind scary. of like scary like world power thing we've ever seen. I'm specifically avoiding <laughs> World War II anything right now. But any kind of like hateful movement like that always comes down to elitism. It's always mm-hmm. like we're great, and you just push a bunch of xenophobic stuff out there, and it works because it it's easy. Yeah. Yep. It's so easy to be like, oh, I'm amazing. on this team and I'm cool for it. Great. Yeah. Nobody's gonna be like, no. <laughs> I yeah. don't want to be included. Yeah, because it plays into those like innate human insecurities of saying like, oh, am I Community. good enough? Like, yeah, you're immediately good enough because of X, Y, and Z. Right. I yeah, think it also basically gives people a stamp of approval that is like, hey, here's a stamp of approval, meaning you don't need to change. You're already the best. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so people are like, oh, that's way easier than trying to improve myself. And that's something you really have to understand about the whole like normie thing is it's not just like I've been exposed to this on the internet before you or anything like that. It's also, it's a whole mentality of like, I get these jokes that the normies wouldn't get and people will post something like, this one, this one's not for the normies out there. It's it's definitely a, a major form of elitism because it's not just I was on the internet before you kind of thing. It's also like I have a more evolved sense of humor and therefore yeah. I'm smarter than you. Yeah, It's weird how much of the internet supports like this intellectual elitism like somehow everyone on the internet especially between the ages of 13 and 19 are smarter than everyone else who has ever lived and oh do you have a phd well i spent six months on the internet so (laughs) i don't care what you think well it's also wrapped up in that age though i mean the the biggest problem is those people especially the younger ones especially the 13 to 15 or even younger like 11 to 15 year olds are seriously 70 percent of the internet and i'm not even (laughs) making that up because they're the ones who have all day to sit and watch youtube and go on reddit and i mean that's all they do so the stuff you see on like the youtube homepage, you're like why is anyone watching this it's those kids all of those comments that are just insane ramblings it's those kids and you'll find the more and more you dig, the more you realize it's just teenagers <clears throat> who are undeveloped and angry. But it also, it's yeah. like, it's not a this generation specific problem. No, like no. If, if we were this age, we'd be the exact same way. I was the so, same way. Yeah, yeah. And we'd have to but, but I, But I think the, <clears throat> the scary part comes in that some of those undeveloped, angry teenagers stay underdeveloped because they constantly live in an echo chamber. Yeah, they, they're like, in that fluffy this, community. This like guy that had a two-year-old son that I was talking to that because he lost at a game and someone else told him he was bad, called him a retard. Like, how do you think that's okay? Yeah. How do you think being like, you know how I'm going to insult you? By insulting an entire group of people that that is already uh, oppressed. Yeah. And maybe I have more emotional attachment to that than most because I have a member of my family that is on the autistic spectrum. And a lot of that is probably me projecting because I was a younger brother and brothers are horrible to each other. I mean, maybe a little bit, but I think it's a useful projection in as much as any are. You know? Yeah. And I just think that kind of hate speech in any kind yeah. is so easy to do on the internet. Yeah, because you have you have just like in the you're in a car like you don't have to see the other person. Right. You can dehumanize them. You can put them in that us versus them mentality. Boom, boom, boom. And everyone else in the league community is doing that. They're they're bolstered by everyone else's behavior. I mean, that's yeah. far from the worst thing they've probably seen yeah. in a game that day. So yeah. And and going back to uh, how I was saying this like reflects heavenly or like spiritual communities. Um, one one thing that kind of scared me upon like running into this idea of heavenly communities are gathered around similar values or loves. I was like, man, that's that sounds boring. Yeah. Like that sounds like I, I I need something more different. And then upon thinking and talking to people about it more, I kind of realized that you find people with differing life, like differing lives and opinions and things. 
<clears throat> but you connect to them through something that you both share. Like if you go and talk to your neighbor who's like a World War II vet and you know has two dogs or whatever, and you have very different lives and your day to day is very different, but you both come back to a love of like doing a nice volunteer thing or like right. having something where you can share that love. I think that's that's what heavenly communities are like. These people from all kinds of different backgrounds and and they like to do different things but they come back to a shared sense of who they want to be like what kind of person you want to be i think those are your best friends in real life too and i think if you've ever i think one of the best experiences with working as a team is working on a team of really diverse people Mm. that all share a common goal and because when you do that and when everyone's coming from a place of love but coming from different angles i think you see a better picture of the whole Mm mm-hmm and it's like it's like that five blind men looking at an elephant analogy. You guys familiar yeah. with that? Mm-hmm. You know, five That's blind men all ways. look at an elephant, and one feels the trunk and says, "Oh, an elephant is is long and and flexible. Elephants are like ropes." And uh, one feels a leg and is like, "Oh, it's it's sturdy and um, unmoving. Elephants are like trees." And one feels a tusk. And it's like, oh, it's long and pointed. Elephants are like spears. And none of them know what an elephant is. They're all just judging from their perception. Um, and I think when you bring all those things together, you have a bigger picture of the whole mm-hmm. than you would <clears throat> any of them by themselves. Yeah, I think it. we're better together. <clears throat> excuse me. We're better together than we are alone. And I want to give a quick shout out to Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. Great oh, book. Good book. But... In this last part I just read was describing how in like a relationship, whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship, it's a case where like one plus one can equal more than two. Like if you have one person with like the, their values and ideas, another person with their values and ideas, when you combine that to solve a problem in a relationship, in business, whatever, if you both use that mutual shared love uh, and have the same wants but come from different backgrounds, you can get to a higher point than either of you could individually. So it's more than a one plus one equals two. It's a one plus one equals three. And I think that's so cool and uniquely human that we can do. And it brings everyone together. I just, I love that. And I I just wonder how to enforce that in a world that appears increasingly polarized. Yeah. You know, where so many people are like, oh, we have different ways of looking at it. Well, then I'm right and you're wrong. And and more than that, you're a bad person for being (laughs) different than me. And well, we see that he was saying on, that to you specifically, Wes. Yeah, You're a Wes. bad person for being different. And we, we all see that, know this. That's we why see I'm that here. We see that across <laughs> religious lines. We see that across political lines. We see that across, like, social class lines. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's so prevalent. I mean, I think, well, the, the, the short and obvious answer for that is because anyone who has any stake in either of those things at, on any legitimate level benefits from that. Anyone, anyone benefits from people being so about their cause that they're like, screw you, buddy, to anyone who is not about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just an ineffective system on like a societal level. It just doesn't work. And I think things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. And that's the only cure is for people to make – like I, I really think it's going to take years and years. But for people to all of a sudden go – Oh man, this hasn't been working for so long. What if we try something else? Oh, well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's like a fever. Yeah, that's the history of humanity. Like we don't change until it's broken. Exactly. <clears throat> like we let things go on for a long, long time until we fall off the edge, and then we're like, "Oh, well, we should have done this years ago." I like this it's podcast. Too late now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I mean, yeah, and I think these truly horrific events are terrible, and. We see amazing things come from it. I mean, I'm going to yeah. do what you were avoiding doing and bring in World War II. Um, <laughs> I think there is a, a history of anti-Semitism throughout all of history. I mean, if you look at the history of the Jewish people, they've been oppressed since yeah. the Bible. And that was true even in like mainstream Christianity, like the, the writings of Martin Luther – Martin Luther wrote a book uh, it's called like On the Jews and Their Lies or something like Oof. that. A great church leader, Oof. but there's just this intense, prevalent anti-Semitism through everyone and no one questioned it. They're like, well, of course the Jews are bad. And it took until it was truly broken and horrific. 
And coming out of World War II, people were like, yeah, that was horrific to hate an entire group of people like that. And it mm. wasn't until things were so broken, and it's, I wish there was a way. There's got to be a way to catch things early. I, I can't, oh. I see the historical evidence that things change once they're so broken, but I don't think that's how it has to be. And maybe that's just idealistic right. of me. You can yeah. catch it early, but I think the problem is getting everyone <clears throat> on board. I think, like we've been saying this whole time, it's because so it's not easy. easy to get everyone. Yeah, yeah. It's so easy to feel like, well, the Jews are terrible, and I'm great as a result because I'm not Jewish. So if if that is such an easy toxic line of thought, how do you combat that? Well, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really the the only way is to already have at, maybe not the education, but at least the empathy or humanistic thought that. Well, obviously that's not true because we're all people going through the human experience. And unless yeah. you have that basic knowledge or at least that shred of, of empathy, like I said, that little thought, you, you can't. You really yeah. can't fight it. Yeah, and it sucks because if you're trying to convince a swath of people to do this other, like, what you, in your opinion, is like the higher road. Yeah. If you're trying to convince this, this massive group of people, you have to present it like, well, this, you have to say that this is easier because... A group of people is just going to pick the easiest thing. Individually, right. you can try to like sway them. Exactly. But when you're dealing with a mass of people, that's, they're going to take the easiest route. That's what I was about to say. Is I forget. Uh, you might you might know what the name of this movie is. Ben. Don't ask him. But Do not ask. Him. There's um, <laughs> there's a, a documentary that just came out I think this year about this guy who um, he's this black guy who goes to KKK members and he sits on their porch with them and he's he's oh, gotten yeah. oh, shoot, yeah. dozens of members out of the KKK just by sitting on Damn. their porch and talking that's with awesome. them. And but but that in that case it's on an individual level and mm -hmm. I feel like that's really like you said the only way to fight it. You can't go to a crowd of virulent racists oh and gosh, say like no. hey stop being racist guys look <clears> at me I'm a nice guy because they're all going to be like <laughs> yeah right like yeah. Because yeah. they, because they, they're still in a group, and like we were saying, yeah. if if you're that, with that people, you still chamber. have that energy, right? Yeah. You have that echo chamber and that physical, like, yeah, well, we're together and we're yeah. on a team. Yeah, and so I think, really, what what this change, yeah, it has to start with individuals, and it's disheartening, I think, a lot of times to be like, hey, I'm just one person, how can I change this? But if everyone thought I'm just one person, so I'm going to change it where I can, right? That's suddenly yeah, not just one person. Start, yeah. um, and I think a lot of that comes down to questioning your own beliefs. And I think people... Or at it's least really, being open to change. I, I think that people should question their own beliefs pretty aggressively. Agreed. And I think people question other people's beliefs aggressively <laughs> and accept their own as postulates, basically. Like, I believe it, so of course it's true. Let's see if mm. what you say is also true. Right. And I think it should, in some ways, be the other way around. Like, this person is saying something because it's been really useful to them. Or at least they think it's been really useful to them. So let, let me hear this out and really think about it. And then, why do I believe what I believe? And really, mm. really, yeah, aggressively question what you believe and see, like, is this still yeah. helping me? Is this still helping the people around me? Or should I be finding something better? Yeah. Well, like aggressively hum humble. You know, yeah. I love it. And it's hard because people are in <clears throat> echo chamber communities where they all they hear all day is people backing up their own beliefs. I have a problem with that, and I I realize I it more and more does, with man. with yeah with Facebook and other stuff because I see and also beyond that once you get into that kind of like echo chamber community beyond all, like just backing up your own beliefs over and over until they're so reinforced like you said you don't even want to look at them it also is really unhealthy in the sense that you just start taking information for granted because i've noticed i will read someone who like i agree with a bunch of stuff on say like oh this movie is terrible and then I'll see it somewhere, someone talking about how good it is in my head. I'm like, well, that movie sucks. And I haven't even seen it. I just <clears throat> absorb that information mm -hmm. and regurgitate it immediately. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, what? I, I don't know. I yeah. don't know anything about that. Like, yeah. I had no actual foundation to base this right. opinion on. What? You're, you just trust that person because you already agree on some things. And that's not good, ever. That's a really, really bad place to be in. But, but as people, yeah. we like to pretend like we have all the answers all the time. Yeah. Like have an informed opinion all the time. Like, I catch myself with that all the... Yeah, always. And it's a hard thing to push up against a lot of the time. And I think there is something to be said for, like, trusting people's opinion 
and people that have sort of had positive things to say in the past, sort of like, oh, what, what else do you have to say? But just <laughs> accepting it as just <clears throat> gospel truth because they've said other things I like uh, is, I think, very dangerous. Right. And I, I really respect, there are some people I've talked to that are on like one political side, but they exclusively subscribe like on Facebook and other places like that to the other side's pages so that they are constantly being flooded with the opposite opinion. Right. I still and, think you have to do that with an open mind, though, because I think people can do that and be like, yeah, I'm looking at the other news and being like, crap, 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 crap. Oh, look at me. Yeah. You know, and it is yeah. still a dangerous thing. Like, it's That's, a good practice, but you have to go into it with the right mindset. Yeah, but it's definitely. also by design, though. I mean, news, especially nowadays, is set up so you either look at it and go, yeah, that's right. Or you look at it and go, no, that is right. absolutely right. wrong. Right, because everything is attuned to this three-second attention span. Yeah. That's just tearing it's things very, off. very intentional. And that's why 90% of headlines you will see now, or news stories or wherever, will have a political party reference in the title. It says, mm-hmm. like, Dems do this, or, like, Libs look at do these this. Republicans yeah. doing this thing. It's it's always that, mm-hmm. every time. Because those, those words catch you, and you're like, oh, what are those Republicans doing now? Or like, those darn liberals every time. You'll always see that. Some kind of reference to a party or a particular figure. Mm. Uh, we need a two-party system. I don't want to get into that right <laughs> now, but... Uh, well, uh, heaven and hell. I think we need a third option. <laughs> <laughs> uh. My whole religion... I just want to live in like a Sonic forever. Can we just do that? Like a Sonic restaurant? Yeah. With, like the, the, with, the, with the scoot, like the rollerblades? Yeah. yeah. Are you I'll just working with the there bathroom? Or are you I'll sick? sleep Customer. in the bathroom and during the day I'll scoot out milkshakes to cars. That's like, mwah. Oh, That's you're right. working there your whole yeah. Like, your whole. But he's eternity. sleeping in the bathroom. I'm you, climbing you the ladder. You chose the bathroom. Be... There are different rooms. You don't have to sleep in. They the probably have like bathroom. a like a employee lounge somewhere. Maybe. No. no. Have you ever seen employee lounge at McDonald's? If it's like a well, he's picking the spiritual Sonic. He could have an employee lounge. But look, no, he's talking about a physical Sonic. Yeah, you, you, a oh, physical Sonic. Yeah, he, oh, okay. This new career. Uh, I'm climbing the ladder. Yeah, I'm Sonic. sorry. I'm talking about my <laughs> career kind of like choices right. right now. This is where I'm headed. I don't think I've ever had a full. Meal I'm sorry before. to flex. I'm sorry to brag. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna sleep in a bathroom. Look at me in three years. I just boys. throw a towel down on the floor, turn all the sinks on hot. It's like a sauna in there. <laughs> that would work. Ugh. We really, uh, what's the word? You got it. Don't help. Yeah, I guess I should sit. Man, heaven is a whole big old topic. But I, I did want to back up like a little bit of where my belief in like heaven being communities comes from, um, that kind of thing. Uh, but basically, <clears throat> I think that people make up heaven and hell. You know, we we go there after we die based upon our life and our life choices. And we join communities there, just like we join Earth communities. So, like, we're spiritual people as much as we're physical people. Uh, even more than. Even more than, yeah, for sure. So maybe we'll do a whole separate podcast on, like, how we think heaven and hell is arranged. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that's a big one. But basically, like, people are in heaven and people want to be in communities. So there are communities in heaven. They're just more perfect than they are on Earth. My basic thought. Yeah. Um, so Wes, what do you what do you think about heavenly communities? You think there are heavenly communities? Um, I guess that that presupposes that you think there's a heaven, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I assume if if there is like some kind of heaven or, or afterlife in that form, there would presumably be some kind of structure to it. And for you, there would just be a sonic. And for me, <laughs> well, I mean, when you go to a sonic, you get a four top, you sit by yourself, you get a six top, you know, those are like the community. And like day or after day into eternity, that'd be good for you. Right. And the manager <laughs> is God. <laughs> okay. I, I think it works. It's a fine analogy. There you go. And the customers are uh, devils. And that lady with that short bob cut, that's Satan. <laughs> <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, oh, your analogy really fell apart <laughs> <laughs> in the best way. I think that yeah, I mean, there. Wes sleeps in the bathroom, be... so I don't know where that puts him. Yeah, in all of this. <laughs> that puts me way up there. <laughs> I pull in all the strings with that sauna bathroom, baby, sliding out milkshakes left and right. And I all make right. It. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> You're not helping me. <laughs> all right. 
and we're rolling. <laughs> Take two. Yeah. Um, I'm not that I, I assume that, yeah, if there is some kind of afterlife, there absolutely has to be some kind of organization to it. Otherwise, I mean, the kind of precludes the perfection of it. How could you have something that is... I mean, Earth is already kind of organized, like we've been talking about this whole time. People naturally do that. Mm -hmm. So whether it's done by, you know, some kind of divine order or God or just spirits categorizing themselves, yeah, I, I assume that would be uh, just how it would have to work naturally. Mm -hmm. But then again, I'm also basing, as we all are, some kind of spiritual notion off of our experience here but we can't really do anything other than that. Otherwise, we're talking yeah. mumbo jumbo alien stuff. So. Right. Yeah. It's like trying to understand the idea of eternity. If there's a God, he's probably existed forever. But when did that start? Dude, right. I legit, because... when I was a child, would cry thinking about eternity. <laughs> it brought me to tears at night in my bed being like, forever? I can't. I can't be in heaven forever. I'll get bored. No, I can't comprehend this. Your and brother comes in and wakes up with a little infinity symbol. You start <laughs> screaming. See, I feel like I had a different experience when I was a kid where people were like, you know, you can never understand what forever would be like or understand eternity. And I was like, no, I think I got it. It's like longer than a long time. It's just like really long. It's just like 15 but back years in, probably. But, but forward and back. No, I feel like it's not that hard. When I was a kid, I was like, no, it's... it's, it's and then... It's not. It's not. It's not easy. <laughs> so we had a very different childhood, Luke. I love what you said about sort of who organizes it, a heaven that would exist. And I think that idea of divine, like divine order, divine design is a really interesting one and in how, in how it plays out. Because I think in some ways there is as someone who believes in God, a divine order that judges everything. Judges that, is a harsh well, word. Well, not Back judges, but but orders everything. Um, like but I like think you order at a sonic? That, like you'd order a sonic, yes. But I think people are the instruments in that order. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that, yeah, a heaven would be organized by a divine order, but that divine order would be organized in people trying to figure out where they belong and where they could be most useful and where they would fit in. And that sort of call of people to go where their love is, I think, is that divine order. And I think it's less like you go here and you go there and more of like sort of almost a, a spiritual science of just how people operate. You know, in the same way that water will always flow the easiest path, a person will always be drawn to where their loves are. And that's what the divine order, I think, is to me. I don't know. Okay. So then I guess the, the like next natural question would be, and I genuinely don't know this, would would those loves be a specific innate thing that that is a mark on your soul and comes from you, or is that God? You know what I mean? Because you're saying the, the divine order is based off of us and our loves. Where do those loves come from? Are we innately like, my loves make up me and they identify who I am? Or is that something that's like God gifted? You know how Sonic has like combo deals? Yes. Now we're speaking my language again. <laughs> I'm back in this. I think it's a combo deal of we are born as these little to be humans that have things from our parents and different personality traits and talents or skills, whatever. And then our environment and how we're raised and who we interact with form these different things in us. So we're a mishmash of all these different things. And I think we choose our loves in as much as they're f we are affected by all these things and they help. And with the power of our choice, then we have those things that we value or we love. And then they are, we see them as ours for sure. Um, because how could you not? Yeah. Um, but but yeah. it's not like God doesn't have a role in anything. Yeah, I think in a, in a co sort of cosmic sense, Everything good is a gift from God because God is sort of the origin of existence. Um, and the bad things that happen are people trying to pull away from that, um, which could be a whole thing about oh, yeah. origin of good and origin of evil. Could be a whole fun conversation. Um, but I think, so sort of cosmically, yeah, they're from God, but it's like, 
there's God made a mountain, but you walk to the base and pick up the rocks you want to put in your basket. Mm-hmm. And that basket is your, your loves, what you care about. But you didn't make any of those rocks. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't make loving whatever you love. You didn't create that love. Yeah. You selected it. I, I mm-hmm. like that. That makes sense. So, so there is the power of human choice there. Right. Yeah. I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's super important. So, like, I'm not the first person to, like, love Sonic, but mm-hmm. I just had, like, a little, like, digital influencer on my shoulder that told me to love Sonic. Yeah. And then I did. And that's well, clearly from God. Sonic's dope. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I get it. I'm, I'm We're actually sponsored this. by Sonic, so. <laughs> and Thanks, Beyond Sonic. Good and Evil. Again, too. I've never had a Sonic <laughs> meal, so. Luke. There's a Sonic right down the road. I'm n- I just feel like they don't exist. It's don't like know. actually a half hour away, but we'll go. It's still It'll down the it. road. It's That's true. Everywhere Everything's is down, down the road. The ro- All right. <laughs> oh, Thank so- you so much for watching. I hope that this conversation was interesting. Yeah. I had a blast. Yeah, I thought it was too. awesome. Yeah. Wes, thank you so much for joining us guys. this week. Yeah, Wes, you're a great man. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Yeah. If you like what you saw, feel free to like us or subscribe. Uh, smash that subscribe button. I had to say it every time, Luke. Um, Be sure heart. to rate us five stars. Yeah. On Links Yelp. in the doobly do. <laughs> Hit me up and, on LinkedIn. And go to Sonic, guys. Get yourself a burger. They do have good drinks. <laughs> That's true. Their milk drinks. Everyone dope. says. Everyone's like, yeah, Sonic's food's terrible, but they have good drinks. Yeah. They have different. Uh, you go to a fast food place for drinks. I so mean, dope. you get those Baja Blasts at Taco Bell. Yeah, that's fair enough. Anyway, we have our podcast on YouTube where we will have the fun video. You can check us out on Google Play or Spotify or iTunes, pretty much wherever you find podcasts these days. Yeah. Hit us up. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you another day. Bra, bra, skr.